UK Games Expo is the biggest board game convention in the UK and there's loads of exciting new games being released there. In this video I'm going to highlight some great games I've already had a chance to try and share the games I haven't played yet which I'm most excited to check out. If you're going to be there, I'm going to be a guest in two live shows. This Game is Broken, which is a comedy panel show about board games, is on at 12pm on Saturday in the Toot Suite. And at 4pm on Saturday, also in the Toot Suite, I'll be in the No Pun Included live show in which we'll be playing Victorian parlor games. I hope to see some of you there and please stop me to say hi as I'm wandering the halls. This is one of the only opportunities in the year that I get to leave this tiny room and actually meet some real humans that watch my videos. I'd highly recommend checking out the Expo Geek List from Slicker Drips that lists what games are going to be there, the Tabletop Together tool that helps you create your wish lists, and the Offline Gamer Annotated Hall Map which shows you where all the publishers' stands are. There's links to those below. Right, let's get to the games. I've put booth numbers on the screen and there's Board Game Geek links in the description if you want to find out more about them. Sushi Roll is a new dice game that's based on the brilliant card game Sushi Go. You're trying to eat the best meal of sushi from the dice that move between players on conveyor belts. The dice bring an excitement to the game as each turn you roll them hoping to get the sushi you need to complete your sets. One tempura on its own is only worth one point, but if you can manage to collect three you'll get ten points. The dice are colour coded. Red has maki rolls, white has eggs, salmon and squid nigiri, and these purple ones have dumplings, tempura and the high scoring sashimi. You can see what types of sushi are likely to be available this round and plan your strategy around it. It encourages you to make informed gambles as you spend reroll tokens to shoot for the sashimi moon. Those big moments bring more shared fun to the table than Sushi Go ever did. You'll be watching out for what other players take as you compete over having the most maki rolls and desserts. And you can spend a swap token to steal a die from another player's conveyor belt before they take their turn. It manages to capture everything that was great about Sushi Go and makes it better. By showing you the dice coming up it gives you more to consider. And adds the thrill of rolling and hoping to get what you need. It's got simple rules, quick gameplay, quality production and just loads of fun. Sushi Roll deserves to be one of the most successful family board games on the market. Don't expect more depth than Sushi Go, but if you love the original game or if you're just looking for a great family game or want to play with non-gamers, you can't go wrong with this one. You'll find it at the Coiled Spring booth. One Key is a cooperative game that has you giving and interpreting clues with surreal artwork. In other words, it's another Dixit and Mysterium inspired game from Libelud, the publisher that brought us Dixit and Mysterium. And this one is best described as a distillation of Mysterium. There's 11 cards in the centre and the clue giver has been secretly assigned one, one key. Each round they will give the other players a clue and the guessers will have to work together to eliminate some cards they don't think are the one key. The clues are given by using more of the same surreal artwork cards with the same stunning illustrations you expect from Libelud. They're bright and colourful and tend to have clearer characters and animals for players to focus their attention on. And the cards all have their own distinct shape which can be used for extra interpretation. Each card is assigned to one of three piles. Red which means it has no connection to the one key, yellow which means it shares some connection and green meaning it's a close match. It can be interesting getting only red clues because you have to then eliminate cards which do share a connection with those red clues. What's really nice is that each round the guessers can pick one from three cards which they want information from. It's an important decision as they need to pick a card which will help them learn more about their options. The giver has pre-assigned their answer. If you ever eliminate the one key you immediately lose. Each round the guessers must eliminate more and more cards until the final round when only one card is remaining. If that's the one key, you win the game. To keep things tense and snappy, you play with a timer so that both the guessers and the clue giver are under pressure, and it's all over in 20 minutes. If you found Mysterium too long, too dark, or too complicated, then one key is the perfect simplification that still retains the fun to try and communicate through imagery and argue over what you're convinced you can see in the artwork. Bosk is a gorgeous looking game from Floodgate Games that has you planting trees and blowing leaves to control areas of a national park. You play through the four seasons. In spring you take it in turns to place all of your trees onto the board, vying for control of the walking trails, because in summer you'll score each row and column on the board. 
Some trees are better than others, so it comes down to the points values, where you'll score points for first and second place of each trail. But that's just a prelude for what's to come. In autumn, the leaves start to fall, and you'll be placing your wooden leaf tokens onto the board to try to win majority in the different terrain regions. Autumn is split up into rounds as each player decides how many leaves they want to place this round, but they have to place them in a line from one of their trees in the direction the wind is blowing. Suddenly that tree placement is feeling even more important. If both your one trees are on this side of the board and the wind is blowing in this direction, you won't be able to exert your leafy dominance. Bosk is a lot thinkier than the theme might suggest. Which tree do you choose to shed its leaves this round? How many leaves? And which regions should you aim for? Is it good to get tokens down on the board early to block other players, or save your higher numbers for later so you can place on top of other players' leaves? Winter is the end of the game when you score the regions and only the leaves on the top of the pile count. Bosk is a good gateway to area control games. The rules are straightforward, but there's plenty of decisions to get your brain stuck into. The artwork from Quan Chai Moria makes this one of the prettiest games out there as that autumnal color palette spreads across the board. Team 3 is a party game from Brain Games that has you working together to build with 3D blocks. One of you knows what you need to build, but can't talk. They have to make hand gestures to a second player who can talk, but can't touch the pieces. They have to decipher the hand gestures and tell the third player what to do, because the third player has their eyes closed. You have three minutes to complete your goal. It's the perfect setup for a party game. Just that right amount of arm flapping and frustration at your teammates not understanding your commands. It's really hard to get it done in time, and even if you do have it cracked, there's two more difficulty levels which add more blocks to the equation. Where it comes alive is when you race against another team to complete the same challenge. You can play six player team versus team at level one with one copy of team three, but if you want to step it up, you can buy the other colored version and play up to level three, or up to 12 players at level one. Having that pressure of seeing how the other team is getting on really ups the excitement. Each color has its own set of goal cards and a unique variant, so it's more than just buying two copies of the same game. The pink game adds cards with three dimensional goals, and the green game gives you a five player co-op mode. Get this one if you like action-packed party games and going head-to-head -head against another team. The Catacombs of Horror is the latest escape room in the Brilliant Exit series, and this time they've gone bigger. The box is twice the size, and so is the content. If you've never played one, Exit the Game are cooperative games that replicate the feel of an escape room, full of puzzles to solve. You can only play through them once, and they encourage you to cut up cards and components to solve certain puzzles. I've had a chance to play this one, but don't worry, I won't be spoiling any specifics. Just like the previous games in the series, they continue to surpass my expectations in how they can continue to bring creativity to puzzles, and once again, the game has surprise moments that will stick in the memory. This one's definitely on the harder side. We turned to the clues a few times, but always found we were close to the answer, just missing one vital angle. This one differs from the others in the series by breaking the game into two chapters, allowing you to have a break after the first couple of hours. And packaging two games in one like this seems to have allowed them to step things up in terms of components. I'm gonna talk briefly about what's in the box when you first open it. If you consider that a spoiler, please skip ahead in the video. I think it's worth mentioning because it sets Catacombs of Horror apart from the others. This game contains a small candle, and three plastic skull tokens, as well as a cardboard box which will unlock more secrets at the halfway point. It's nice to see that Cosmos hasn't rested on their laurels with this series, and are giving us exciting reasons to come back to it. But if you're new to these type of games, I'd recommend starting with an earlier, easier installment, such as Abandoned Cabin. Dragon's Breath is a dexterity game from Haber that's marketed at young kids, but brilliant fun for adults as well. It's not only a unique take on dexterity, but it's a betting game. Each round, one player will be in charge of melting the ice, which means lifting one of these plastic rings off the stack. As you lift it, some of the crystals inside will likely topple over the edge. It's up to you to predict which color will fall out the most that round. In turn, you select a color and you will win every gem that falls out of your color. The person melting the ice gets to pick last, but they have control over how they lift the ring. They could go slowly, nudging the color they want out, or desperately try to keep everyone else's crystals inside. They can't touch the crystals, but they can have a huge impact. 
It's fun looking at the stack and guessing which ones will fall, but it's even better having that human element of someone trying to cheat nature. Often they'll try so hard to pull something off and then just end up with loads of crystals falling out. And for extra drama, there's holes in the floor. If the crystals fall in there, they don't score at all. Dragon's Breath is one of the best kids games I've ever played, but I've never actually played it with a kid. It's great entertainment for adults too, and it's staying in my collection. Buy this one for kids, or if you just want a one-of-a-kind dexterity game. Inuit the Snow Folk is a card game from Board and Dice about building the best Inuit tribe. Each turn you flip over a card and add it to the pool in the middle. Then you take an action which involves taking some cards from the middle. You have six options. You can take new tribes folk, take special rights and spirits cards, kill people for their weapons, or hunt orcas, polar bears, or seals. As you build your tribe, you're recruiting to do certain jobs which makes you better at future actions and improves your engine. Taking an elder action now allows me to pick up one person who I will then assign to the elders. So next turn, if I take an elder action, I can pick up two people from the center, making it more efficient. Then I assign those two to seal hunting so that when three seals appear, I can hunt them all with one action for six points. You have to decide how best to improve your engine. If you assign more people to scouting, you can flip over more cards at the start of your turn. But what's the point of that if you don't have an action that can pick those cards up? And if there's a polar bear sat there worth four points, shouldn't you just kill it? Well, you could spend the turn building for the future, but that's just handing those four points to the next player. At the end of the game, you'll get minus points for any people you've recruited that don't match your tribe color. But it can be worth it to get your engine going early on. The game whips around at pace and you can pick it up in minutes. The card flips can make the game lucky, but there's also a nice push your luck aspect. Should you keep flipping to get more of what you want, or will you just set the next player up for a stronger turn? For a light game, the engine building packs some decisions and the artwork is beautiful. Check this one out if you're after a simple gateway level card game. Paras is a one of a kind dexterity game with a handcrafted hardwood board. It combines the fun of throwing dice with the tactics of an area control game. It's from Cubico Games, a company known for quirky games that revolve around handmade bits of wood. Paras is simple, each square represents a territory. You start in one of four corners, and each turn you must decide what action to take. If you want to parachute troops into battle, you take two dice and throw them onto the board. Where they land will determine where your troops drop in, and the value tells you how many units you can deploy. What makes this special is that if your dice physically knock cubes out of a space, they stay where they land, so you can try to oust an opponent by force. For more considered attacks, you can attack by ground, which involves a cute bluffing mechanism. You pick a hidden number on a die from one to the number of troops you're attacking with. Your opponent has to guess that number, but they only have as many guesses as they have defending units. So if you come in strong, you'll have better odds at surviving the battle. At a convention, it's nice to find unexpected curios that you won't find in your average board game shop. Paras is full of character, both in its gameplay and its look. If you're interested, be quick as there aren't many copies available, or check out the Kickstarter for it, which is running at the moment. Those are the games I've already had a chance to play before the convention. These next games are the ones I'm most excited to play at the convention but where some of them are only available to demo, not to buy. Undo is a new line of games available to buy from Pegasus Spieler that has you traveling back in time to undo sudden deaths. There's been a murder or suicide and you'll be visiting points of that person's life, minutes, hours, or years before their death to try and change their fate and save them. They're described as telling extraordinary emotional stories, which is something that I love seeing board games tackle and I'm really excited to get stuck into these. Each box will focus on a different person's death, so there's room for telling wildly different stories. One of the scenarios is set in Japan in the year 2000. I'll just read the description that they give. A man in his 60s lies lifelessly on the floor of his living room, a broken wine glass and the photo of a young woman in a wheelchair next to him. The deceased wears an old-fashioned blue suit and has no visible injuries aside from a barely perceptible scar above the eye. In his jacket, a telephone rings with the melody of Moonlight Sonata, and on the table lie cherry blossom branches. I'm really excited by how much emphasis the description is placing on the story. It really feels like the primary goal of the game is to learn about this man's life, and that's fascinating to me. They're clear to point out that this isn't a game about solving a crime or catching a murderer. You are literally tasked to prevent his death, 
and every player will have a momentous decision that will ultimately determine whether the man lives or dies. I've scarcely read a more exciting premise to a game. Undo are cooperative one-shot experiences, and that four-letter name and box size makes me think this is inspired by the Exit game series. But if it can meet that ambitious description, this could blow escape room games out of the water for me. Homebrewers is a game for demo about brewing beer that is the spiritual successor to Brewcrafters since it's from the same publisher, Greater Than Games, and shares a designer. Brewcrafters is one of the only heavier Euro games that I own, and I love it because it does a great job of capturing its theme, a theme I really love. This game uses dice to determine what actions you can take, but interestingly, you can trade dice with each other to get the actions you want, or spend money to change the face of a die. There's flavor cards which you add to a type of beer that you're making so that every time you make it, you get extra benefits. And you've got to keep track of your sanitation levels, which will impact the quality of your beer. From first glance, this one doesn't seem as true to its theme as Brewcrafters, but it is less heavy, so it might appeal to more people. Clank Acquisitions Incorporated Upper Management Pack is a new expansion Renegade will be selling for Clank, a deck building game about stealing treasure from a dungeon. They've teamed up with webcomic Penny Arcade to combine Clank with Acquisitions Incorporated, which is Penny Arcade's Dungeons and Dragons podcast about a company of professional thieves. This collaboration will be bringing us Clank Legacy, which will be available later this year, but for now we can get excited about Upper Management Pack, which is an expansion that introduces character-specific starter decks and miniatures. It's going to add asymmetry to the game as you'll each have unique starting strengths. It seems like an easy thing to add to games of Clank that will make it just more interesting with no extra rules. And what's great is that this expansion can be played with original Clank or the upcoming Clank Legacy. Seize the Bean is a deck building game for demo about running a coffee shop. What sounds so interesting about this one is how well the gameplay fits the theme. As you grow your coffee shop, you attract new customers that are added to your deck. And as you continue to run your coffee shop, just like in any deck building game, those cards will reappear, representing the customers returning to your shop. Each time they return, you have to make sure you can satisfy them by serving them what they want. If you don't, they'll leave you bad reviews. That's such a clever use of deck building that I'm interested to try it for that alone. Letter Jam is a cooperative word game for demo from Czech Games Edition, the company who brought us code names, and it's that pedigree that makes me want to try every party game they release. Each player is given a set of letter cards that can form a word. The twist is you can't see your own cards. You have one in front of you, facing away from you, like in Hanabi. The challenge is to come up with a word that uses the letters you can see around the circle. When you do, instead of saying the word, you put numbers in front of each letter you used so that the players know where in the word their letter appears. With that partial information, they need to guess what the word could be and thereby guess what the missing letter they can't see their letter is. If you guess your letter right, you're on to the next one, and the goal is to work together to help each other guess as many as possible. This one's a hard one for me to be completely convinced by until I've played it, but I like word games, I like cooperative games, I like party games, so I'm hopeful this innovative attempt pays off. Copenhagen is a Tetris-shaped tile-laying game from Queen Games. I'm interested in this one because it's from designers Daniel and Asger, who made A Tale of Pirates, and 13 Days, two games I really love. It's a gateway level game where you're picking up sets of colored cards to trade in for the Tetris shapes that you want to build facades of houses in the colorful neighborhood of Nyhaven. You score points when you complete rows or columns, and if you can get a full line of windows, you get extra points. Queen Games have a habit of making deceptively interesting games like Luxor from last year. At first glance of the rules of this one, I can't see a strong hook that sets this one apart from other Tetris games, but I'm expecting that to reveal itself when I get to play it, as often happens with these types of games. Jetpack Joyride is a real-time puzzle game from Lucky Duck Games that's based on the mobile app of the same name. I got to try this one out at last year's UK Games Expo, and I had a blast. Unfortunately, it's still demo only, but will be released in the coming months. The idea is simple. Everyone is playing on the same level map that looks like a platformer game, and you have to race in real time to pick up plastic Tetris pieces and use them to create a path for your character. There's loads to consider, obstacles you want to avoid, items you want to pick up, and missions that you're trying to complete. And those awkward Tetris shapes don't make it easy. But more than anything, you need to do it quickly because once someone's finished, you have to stop. And if you've barely made it through, you're gonna suffer for it. 
I love the frenetic pace, and while I have a lot of real-time games, they're almost all cooperative. This is a competitive one that I've really enjoyed. Having different missions, different maps, and collecting powerful gadgets means that every game is going to be a new puzzle to solve. I can't wait to add this one to my collection. Quantified is a cooperative game for demo with a powerful theme of fighting for human rights. It's set in a world under constant surveillance, and each player starts in a different place on the social ladder. One is a refugee, another is unemployed, another is employed. Their status has an impact on their freedoms and the actions they can take. For example, a player without freedom of movement will struggle to move around the city. A player without freedom of speech can't share their cards with other players. The game is trying to emulate the feeling of having your human rights infringed by limiting and frustrating you in the game. That sounds brilliant and especially applied to such an evocative, meaningful theme. I'm always attracted to games tackling new topics and even more so when they're about serious real-life problems. Plus, no pun included, tried this one out last year and loved it. Those are the hottest games at UK Games Expo this year. If you found this video useful, please support me making more videos like this on Patreon. I look forward to seeing some of you in Birmingham. I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.